Okay, hello everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to the seventh lecture in the numerical methods and computing. Uh, in the last lecture, we have started the third part of the course that is about the solution of the linear systems. Okay, so as a short recap, what we did was to going through the I mean, main idea. So we have a linear set of uh, algebraic equations, right? And as we said, in general, we can have m equations and n unknowns. So we discussed shortly the, the Kramer's rule for, for finding the roots of an n by n system. So it was quite easy and straightforward. So what we need to do is to have the determinant of the coefficient matrix calculated, then we, if we want to find the ith root, then we have to substitute the ith column in this coefficient matrix by the right-hand side vector, this b1 to bn, and then find the determinant of the resulting matrix and dividing it by the, and the division of di by d is going to give us the ith root. Uh, so we had an example, but today we are going to uh, look into a very important approach uh, for solving the linear set of equations, and that is called Gaussian elimination. So <clears throat> I'm going to So have you heard about this approach before? Okay, perfect. So you have probably an idea, but we are going to start from the uh, basics. So again, what we have here is an n by n system of equations, as you see here. We have n unknowns x1 to xn, and for them we have n equations. Okay? So therefore, I can write this as ax equals b where a is n by n, x is the solution vector, is n by 1, and b is n by 1, the right-hand side vector. So what we do in Gaussian elimination is that we should apply elementary transformations, which basically means that we, subs we uh, multiply different rows by some scalars and add them up to other rows. And we do this for the purpose of getting these triangular matrices on the uh, left hand side. So basically what we want to do is that we, we will start from this given matrix, this system of equation, and this A is going to be transferred to a, some R, right? That is a triangular matrix. So can you tell me please why do we need to have this, this triangular matrix? Yes, please. Exactly, because we shouldn't forget what the aim is. The aim is to, to solve this linear system here, right? And we are looking for different approaches to do that. And one approach is that, okay, we reform with just simple transformation techniques, which is, I mean, multiplication of the rows by some constant, adding them to other rows, in order to get this triangular matrix. And the good thing is that, exactly, so we can start from the last equation here, right? And from here, we can directly get xn, which is cn over this rnn. And rnn is a, is, is a value that has been obtained during this Gaussian elimination procedure that we are going to go through soon. So if we get this xn, we go back to the previous equation, where we have xn and xn minus 1 as unknown. But in this case, since we have xn known, there is only x n minus 1 remains to be obtained, which is directly, you can get it from the, this equation. So it's exactly what we call uh, backward substitution. Which means that we start from the last row, we get x n, we plug it in the previous one, we get x n minus 1, 
and we continue this to go to the first equation where we get x1 knowing x2 to xn. So this is the general formula for this uh, back for uh, substitution, the last equation, okay? So this is a general idea, and we want to see how we can do that. And so is there any question about this general thing? Okay. So this is what we do. We should just do it through, I mean, several steps. So always we do not touch the first equation. I mean, this is what it is. As you see, I keep it like that. So what I have here is just row 2 to row n, right? So if I want to eliminate the first column of them, which means that whatever the multiplication of x1 is, I want to remove it from all equation from the second to the nth row, what should I do? So I start from this, I mean, here, I want to remove this a by that was here. So I want to remove this, okay? What, what should I do? Is that I should multiply the first row by A12 and divide it by A11 and then add it to this equation. Is that correct? Very good. So we just multiply the first equation by minus a12, that is the coefficient that we want to remove, divide by a11, and this is, this is clear. We want this a11 denominator to be cancelled out with what, with what we have. So basically, you do not need to memorize any formula here. I mean, you just need to grasp the idea. So, but a very, two important things here. So when you do this multiplication, I mean, you'd multiply the first row by this value and add it to the second row. Be careful that you should also I mean, do it to all the components here, those which are multipliers of x2 to xn or x1 to xn, and also the right-hand side, which in this case, b1 is going to be multiplied by minus a12 over a11 and be added to b2. Okay? So, as you see here, we put this superscript 1 here, which means that the, these are the modified coefficients in the first uh, uh, Gaussian elimination. Is that here, what, what I'm talking about? Yes, please. Sorry? Okay, yeah. So, let, let's go back here. So, this is the main idea, right? This is the general formula. I want to get from here to here. For this purpose, what I need to do is that we start applying this Gaussian elimination through a number of steps. In the first step, I would like to get rid of these, uh, the coefficients x1, right? The contribution of x1. So for this, I should look at what is this, the, the corresponding coefficient and then think about, okay, what should I multiply this row 1 by? Which if I add it to this second row or third row or to nth row, I can get rid of this, I mean, the, the leading term. Okay? Which means that we have different multipliers for different rows. As I said, we do not touch the first equation. Okay? So we keep the first equation as it is. And then for the second row to nth row, what we need to do is to find this multiplier which I basically explained to you what it should be for the second row. Again, you don't need to memorize anything. Just look at what you need. Okay? So then I go to the third row. Again, I look at the first equation and see what I should have here as a multiplication to get rid of the first element in the third row. And that is going to be M31 which means that this is minus i31 over a11. Okay, so I apply it to the third equation. And then going to the fourth and continue that to nth. So what I get as, yes, please. Yeah, no, no, no. So what you do is that you multiply, so this is what you do. 
by row one plus row two. This is what you do. So this multiplication that you have, this has to be multiplied by row one and be added to the i row. So exactly, so I, if you ch choose i to be two, this is what I do to the second row. So if I go to the third row, then it becomes minus a13 over a11 multiplied by row one again plus row three. So what I get as a result of this, which means that at the end of this step one, what I get is that I get rid of all the contributions, I mean, for, for x1, or all the multiplication of x1. Yes, please. OK. So can it? How to find? So, so, for the multiplier, you've got A12 over A11. How come it's not A21? Oh, sorry, it's A21, sorry. Yes. Ah, I'm sorry. And yeah, this is exactly the, the, the thing that I have here, yes. We're just sorry about that. Okay, is that clear? I made a mistake there. Yes, please. So for this one? Ah, it's the same thing. So this multiplier is just going to be multiplied by the whole row, including the right-hand side. And then we add it to the, I mean, this row two in this case, which means that the left-hand side are going to be added together. So sorry about that mistake. So here, since we have a21 that I want to get rid of, so then we have to have this i equals to 2. So this is step 1. So I get rid of the x1 multipliers for all equations except the first one. How, how we wrote yeah, it like this? Like that is always okay. Exactly. So this that matrix that we had is just equivalent to the linear system, yeah. and this is a linear system of equations. You can write this into a, a form of a matrix. So a multiplied by x equals b. So both are equivalent. That's the matrix form. This is just the equation. It's not like one or two. Yeah. yeah, because you can just switch between two. And yeah, exactly. So. It's like we have matrix form and also this equation form. OK, so we go to the next step. You remember in the first step, we didn't change equation one, row one. Now we are in the second step. What we do is that we do not touch the first and the second. The so second is just the last that we got from the first step. And that makes sense, right? Because we would like to have a triangular. As I said, just try to grasp the idea. And now I would like to get rid of whatever is the multiplier of x2 from the third row to nth, OK? So for this purpose, whatever I had from the last step, I get this, I mean, the coefficient a22. In the denominator, in numerator, I have a a2, a i2. So again, the idea is that, I mean, you should find the multiplier, which if you multiply the second row by that and add it to the third row, you get rid of the first, el first element in the third row. And of course, if you go to the fourth row, it would be different, that multiplier. And this multiplier is this guy. So I guess if we have an example soon, it would be much easier. OK, so you continue this. And then third step, what you need to do is that you do not touch whatever you have at the first, second, and third equation, and try to get rid of whatever is the multiplier of x3 from the fourth row beyond, right? 
So as a result of this, you have this general formula. So it's a, uh, as you see here, so in the end, if you have this general formula, then you will end up with this triangular matrix, which is exactly the final result that you should get from Gaussian elimination. So always we will, so, so in the first step, we were dividing, I mean, these multipliers, when we wanted to calculate that we had to have division by A11, right? But the question is that what happens if this A11 is zero? Or in the second step, A22 is zero. Do you think we can do the Gaussian elimination in the way that we described? Of course not, because we cannot divide by zero. So this is one of the uh, big problems that we have. So, but we have some solutions to, to overcome the situation. So I try to explain this by an example, and then try to explain to you what I mean if we have this bad condition here, and then we provide some solutions to it, okay? Okay. So here is an example. So we have three equations, three linear equations. So we have an, if you, want, you would like to write this, I mean this, you can write it in form of a matrix equation. which this guy is, can be a, a, this can be vector x, and this can be vector b. Okay, this is the answer to your question. So always you can switch between the two four. Okay, so we have a, 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 a system of three linear equations, and what we want to do is to apply the Gaussian elimination method to find the solutions for x1, x2, and x3. So, so can you please just, just look at here? I mean, so I want to get rid of this, the first one, I mean 2x1 in the second row. What should be the value if by, my, if by which I multiply the first row and add it to the second row, I would get rid of this 2x1? Minus half. So if you multiply 4 by minus half, you get minus 2. So if then minus 2x1 uh, plus 2x1 would result to 0. And this exactly gives you what you want. So as I said, you don't need to memorize anything. But if you apply the formula that we just saw, m21 is that, OK, a a11 is 4, and a21 is 2. Okay, so let's do this. As I said, you keep the first equation as it is. Because it's just the first step, right? Then, okay, you multiply the whole row, the first equation, by this factor, minus, minus half. So if you do this here, so it will be 4 multiplied by minus half, then add it to the second row, 2x1. Do you agree with me? Then we go to this next one. So again, you are multiplying the first row by mi minus half, which means that this minus two here is also going to be multiplied by minus half. And then you add it to the corresponding term here. That is x2. Huh? So for the third one, minus one multiplied by minus half, then plus one. This is x3. So this is going to be one multiplied by minus half plus five. So before moving on, do you agree with me? Is there any question here? Very good. So we do the same thing to, the, to, to remove this 8x1 from the third equation. 
So again, can you tell me what is the value by which if I multiply this the first row and add the, result, the resulting expression to the third row, I would get rid of this x, x, 8x1. So well, what is the value? It's minus 2, right? If you multiply the first, first row by minus 2, you get minus 8 here. If you add it to this, you get rid of this 8x1. Be careful, you shouldn't use the same value that you use for the second equation. Okay? You should just use the corresponding multiplier here. So, 4 multiplied by minus 2, which is my m31, and add this to 8x1. Then we go to the second one. So minus 2 multiplied by minus 2 plus minus 1. Minus 1 multiplied by minus 2 plus 1. And as we said, whatever that you do, you should apply it also to the right-hand side. So this 1 multiplied by minus 2 plus 5. So, again, we get the first row, I mean, unchanged. The second one, okay, 4 multiplied by minus 2 is minus 2, plus 2, just you, they cancel each other. So, this will give you 3x2, and then you do the algebra right here, okay? But still, we are not done, because we are not having any triangular matrix. We need one more step. So for that, again, so can you tell me what I should do? Just based on, I mean, what you think is correct to do, yes? It's already seen down in step two. You have, to, you, have to, you have to terminate the x2 value from the third and last column. Oh, exactly. Okay, yes. So, I mean, we shouldn't work with the first equation anymore because if you multiply this and add this to the others, you are going to introduce, I mean, multiplication of x1 again, something that we wanted to get rid of. So what you need to do is that you start from the second equation and say that, okay, I want to get rid of this. And for that, what I need to do is that if you compare to the corresponding coefficient the second uh, row, so you have to multiply this by minus 1, add this to this, to the third row. Is that correct? Do you see it? Okay. So what you need to do, I'm not using any formula. I'm just looking at the, what I should do. That's why I'm saying just grasp the idea. The rest is easy. But be careful that you do not change this multiplier when you do the operation for until you finish the operation on, the, on, on that specific line. Okay, so what you need to do is that you multiply this 3 by minus 1 and add this to the corresponding element, so this is x2, plus this guy multiplied by minus 1, plus 3x3, and this is 9 half multiplied by minus 1 plus 3. And this is going to be this equation. As we said, we are in the second step, which means that the first two rows are going to be untouched. And you, you can see it also. So you have, I mean, generally you have, uh, in total you have three unknowns, okay? Then you have two unknowns, so the last row should have only one unknown, then you, you will get the, the, the triangular form. And this is exactly what you end up with. So is it clear here? So do you think we understood or do we have any problem with, with the Gaussian elimination? Anything unclear? Again, you don't need to memorize anything, just you should understand what we should do.
Very good. Uh, but we have uh, here a slight problem, in fact. Or maybe I should explain this as well, sorry. <clears throat> okay, when, when we get to this point, we can get x3, which is minus 3 half and 3 half, right? Which make, gives us minus 1. So put this in the second equation, 3x2 plus 3 half of x3, and you already have the value of x3, that is minus 1, this is 9 half. So you just you can get x2 equals to <clears throat> 2. And then you have x3 and x2 known, put them in the first equation, then you get 4x1 is 1 minus plus 2, multiplied by x2 plus minus 1, which is the x3. So it gives you the value of x1. So this is exactly the meaning of back substitution. OK. I need to switch the slides for a second. So, well, let's look at this example. We, we observed that, okay, Gaussian elimination is a very nice approach. We can apply it. I mean, because it's very systematic. If you learn the algorithm, then you can write a computer code to apply a Gaussian elimination to a matrix. But let's look at this uh, equation, I mean, this set of three equations here. So here we have this R coefficient matrix, A, and we have three unknowns on the right-hand side. So if you apply the uh, Gaussian elimination, this is what you get in the end. As we said, the first equation is going to remain unchanged. And then you try to build a, tri uh, sorry, a, a, a tri triangular matrix, which you do. But in the end, the solution that you get are x1, x2, and x3 given here. And this is with the assumption that you have only six significant digits. Okay. But if you repeat the same procedure, apply Gaussian elimination, but this time you consider 10 significant digits. It's very interesting to note that the solution that you will get in the end for x1, x2, and x3 will be different to what you had before. You have done, you, have, you didn't change anything. The system of equations is the same. You apply the same approach. You have taken the same steps. But the only thing that has changed is that when you were dividing the values and doing the calculations, one time you consider to have only six meaningful digits, and next time, I mean, 10 significant digits. 
So what's wrong? What do you think is the source of the problem here? Any clue? If you, if you look at the, the coefficient matrix, what's wrong with it? Yes, Yeah. Okay. It's exactly. It's too small, right? Exactly. If you are going to only keep six digits, then you have only three and five zeros before. Exactly. So, but if you look at the others, okay, they have at least. I mean, they have. They are larger. So what happens when you do Gaussian elimination? As we said, then in the first step, you are going to just find multipliers of the first row which if you add them to the second and third row, you're going to get rid of the coefficients of x1, right? But if you do that, if you want to complete, uh, compute, calculate that multiplier, then you have to divide, for instance, this 0.21 by this small value, this a11. You will end up with this large number. So also for the third row. But if you go to the next step, you will end up with a small number. So there's like a... Uh, there is some scaling problem between the entries and the elements in the matrix. And the issue is that, I mean, this, the, the one that, is, that has the smallest value is the one that you are using in the denominator of these coefficients when you do Gaussian elimination. So this is going to kind of uh, make the solutions of this case when you have six significant digits wrong. So nothing went wrong. You can, if you write the code, if you do this by hand, everything is doable. You will end up with a solution, but that's not correct. So the question is that, okay, what should we do? Okay, there is a simple criteria, and it says that at each step that you are applying Gaussian elimination, be careful that, stick to the fact that you would like to have these multipliers with the value the absolute value less than one. Okay, which means that you you are not. This is okay. This M three two because less than one, but the first two are not okay. They are very large. Okay. So as a criterion, we are always kind of careful that we have this condition satisfied. So how to do that? So as a general, I mean, just consider that you have done A minus 1, I mean, operations for the Gaussian elimination, and you are this part within this blue line as the unprocessed part of the system of equation. Do you get what I mean here? So you have done Gaussian elimination. For instance, you have gotten rid of this the first, I mean, term for the second one, and so on, and you are here in the i-th row. So you have a square matrix that starts from i and goes to n in terms of the rows and also columns. And we want to see, okay, when we are at this point, or a general i, what we should do to make sure that this multiplier has a magnitude that is smaller than 1. So we have two, two approaches. I will explain it ex again through an example because it's, I mean, a bit involved. So what we do is that what we do is, is, is pivoting. But pivoting is just either partial or complete. Okay? So if you want to do partial pivoting, it means that, so we only look at this column in the untreated or, I mean, this untreated part of the system of equation, this within these blue lines. Okay? So we look at from, I mean, between AII to N, and why, which one is the largest in magnitude, okay? Which one, which of these kind of orange column has the largest value? Whatever that is, we should just bring it to the i row. Kind of switch it with what we, we already have. So for instance, if a and i in this row, I mean this n, a and i is the largest magnitude here, then we should bring this to AII, I mean this i throw, and then move this i throw to that equation. 
to, to the last row. Okay? Yes, please. So you change the entire row. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So I guess I can explain it better here. Yes. Okay. So for the partial pivoting, we are looking at this column. And we shouldn't forget that. Here we have x1, x2, 2, xi, 2, xn. And on the right hand side, we have some b prime 1, 2, 2 b prime. So I'm saying b prime because, I mean, we already have done some uh, operation on the Gaussian, Gaussian elim uh, elimination. So these values are different from what we have at the beginning. So if you, for instance, switch the last row with this i row, what happens is that it's just the rows which are being switched, right? So we are not going to change the order of this unknown here. So we are not going to change anything in this matrix. But since we are switching b and, I mean, nth row with the i row, we have to switch the right corresponding right-hand side as well. So I'm explaining partial pivoting. You just look at this, find the value, I mean, the, the coefficient in this column, which has the largest magnitude, and bring that to the leading row, which in this case is the i row. You don't need to change anything in the unknown vector here, the x, but you have to switch the right-hand side <coughs> elements. So I mean this guy. But you can also do a complete pivoting, which means that if, again, you consider this kind of untreated part of the matrix, then you should look at all elements and find out which one has the largest mag uh, magnitude. Okay? If something here, for instance, an element here has the largest value, you should bring it to the leading term here. Okay? Are you talking about the largest magnitude value? Yes. Always we are talking about magnitude. So, but since you are doing that, you have, so we should see, I mean, which column this element is located on. Then you should also switch the whole column. The first one, the ith one, I mean here, or the first one in the untreated matrix, with this one. This is the second thing you need to do. So first you move this, I mean swap these two, then swap the columns, and since you are just moving the elements, which means that the corresponding x is going to change also. So the, again you have to switch the corresponding x and also corresponding b. So as you see, this general pivoting is more involved and you have to do more operations compared to the partial pivoting. So it's like, look at it, I mean, not exactly, again, I mean, just grasp the idea. It's just a mathematical thing. I mean, you're just playing with the matrix. You're just moving that element, but you should understand what we are doing. So what we are doing is that, okay, we move there, move this there. So of course, they were being multiplied by the corresponding x. Since we are sw switching these two, I mean, we should switch also the corresponding x as well as the columns. And then, since this row is going to, I mean, to the ith row, and the ith row is coming here, the corresponding elements should also switch. So I explain this now through an example, okay? Does it look complicated or? A bit, yes, at the, at the first look, but let's look at this. So this is the example which we saw that is a bit tricky, right? Because of the first element. So I would like to treat this in a way that Gaussian elimination is going to result in accurate uh, values for the unknowns. So what we need to do is that, okay, what I want, I, I want to do is the complete pivoting. It's the second approach that you saw is more involved. If you learn how to do this, then the other one, the partial pivoting, is much easier. 
So, okay, what is the largest, uh, what is the element with the largest magnitude here? Is this guy, right? So what I should do is that I should move this to, the, to this first place, right? So I do that and then bring that value to, the, to here. I mean, I'm switching these two. Okay, and the other thing is that we, we need to also uh, switch the columns, which I do. So, you see here I have this point 0.17, whatever here. Now that I'm moving this row, I'm switching this row, then I have to switch the columns as well. Which means that if first you just move it to the first row, and then you switch the columns. So it becomes in the second column. So also for this guy, the first row, when you bring it to the third row, you have to also switch the columns which you do. So, to summarize, you switch the rows and also you switch the columns. So what happens to the second row? Nothing. Nothing changes there. I mean, to this one, nothing changes. I mean, because the, everything that we are doing is just between the, these two. Right? Yes, please. Yes, yeah, exactly. This is the column also, as I said. So it is exactly when you switch the rows again, you have to switch the columns. But one more thing. So this row was, I mean, this guy was multiplier of what x two, and this guy was multiplier of x one. So we did the whole thing to switch these two. So exactly as you see here. The first place is now for x2 instead of x1, and the second place is for x1. And the last thing that we need to do is that, okay, we were doing these for the elements which are located on the first and third rows, so we should switch the values, as you see here, on the right-hand side. Okay, we start from here, we move this, to the here, which means that when we switch this, we should, we should also change the corresponding rows, switch the corresponding rows. And then, since this change is happening between the first column and second column, we switch these two. But only for the first and third row. I mean, do not change anything. Uh, also, apply, for, sorry. When we do the column change, we apply to the whole thing. Also including the second row. But when we switch the values, I mean, second row is unchanged. Only for the column we change it. Then we should look at the corresponding values in the x and switch them as well. And again on the right hand side. And again, be careful. So for the x, we did the change between this, this first and second rows. But here, for the values of the right-hand side, we did it for the first and the third. Is it clear? Because, I mean, if you multiply this to x, so this guy is going to be multiplied by x1, and this guy is going to be multiplied by x2, and we did the whole thing just for switching these two, so you have to switch x2 and x1. But for the row, so we are changing things between the rows first row and the third rows, therefore the corresponding values on the right hand side and the first and third row have to be switched. So if you do that, you will end up with this. And again, I mean, if you look at it, it's going to give us what we were looking for. So we have the largest value here. If you divide the second row by this largest value and just uh, I mean, do the, the find, find the multiplier, add it to the second or third row, then you will get this zero without any problem. And then, in the next step, so this is the kind of the, the active part of the operation of the matrix. 
So here, we would like to do the global pivoting or complete pivoting. Well, what does it mean? So which means that this element here that's going to appear in the denominator of the multiplier is going to be switched with the with the, with the value that is that is kind of that has the largest magnitude, which in this case is this guy. So again, we switch the rows, we switch the columns, we switch the corresponding x and also the right hand side. So if we look at this, so as we said, we are going to switch these two, which I do, and then switch the rows. When you switch the rows, also the right hand side should be switched, as you see, compared to this. Then we have to switch the columns which I do, and since I have switched the columns, I have switched the, the values on the uh, uh, solution matrix. I mean, you will get the sense of that if you do the example yourself and think about what you're doing. Since this is like, the, this active part is just two by two, so everything becomes very nice and kind of trivial in this case, because we have only two rows, we have two colors, so we have nothing else to switch. I mean, we have only one possibility. Okay? So do you have any question about this? Is it clear? First, what is Gaussian elimination? And then we said that, okay, but we would like to find those multipliers by which we are getting, re uh, we are making a triangular matrix. We may have problem in some cases, I've explained where. So in order to treat that, we should do pivoting, and that can be done through Partial or complete pivoting. So partial is much easier. You just look at, so for instance, if you want to do this in this case, the partial, can you tell me what has to be done? Yes. Here. Partial. So partial, which means that, okay, this is my active, the active part of the matrix, right? So I should look at only the first column. So do I have the value here which has the largest magnitude in the column? Yes. So no pivoting is required. That's it. This is the best thing you can get based on partial pivoting. Okay? But for the complete one, since we have a value that has a larger, larger value, then we have to do, I mean, the switch. So if we continue, as you see here, So we get this triangular matrix, but be careful that, I mean, because of these uh, pivotings, the order of these coefficients have changed. So if you, do, if you start from the last row, you get the value of x1 directly, you plug it back to the second row, you get x3, and you have x1 and x3, use the first row and you get x2. What I can suggest you is that you go through the example, and if you have problem, I mean, come to me and feel free to ask. I guess you, will you also practice this type of things in the tutorial, which is on, I guess, yes, you have it this week, or Thursday. So may I have five minutes, or? Okay. So we were talking about the, uh, the linear system, how we can solve them. So there, there is a condition here that is about consistency. Yeah. So first, we should see if a system is consistent or not. Okay? If it is inconsistent, Okay, it's not solvable, has no solution. So basically, we have this. If it is inconsistent, then we have no question. Doesn't have any solution, and that's it. 
But if it is consistent, then it may have a unique solution or infinitely many solutions, which is non-unique solution. And we would like to investigate that. So if you remember, uh, when we were talking about the Kramer's rule, we said that we should look at the determinant of the coefficient matrix A. If the determinant is zero, then okay, we do not have anything, I mean, no solution. But if it is non-zero, this is a sufficient condition to have solution. So either these solutions are unique or not. So that's the thing that we would like to understand here. But what we can do here is that we extend the condition that we have. When we were talking about determinant of A, we were just looking at the cases where we have M equals to N. M is the number of equations and N is the number of unknowns. If we have the same number of unknown uh, equations, we have the same, we have equations, N equations and N unknowns, then we do not have a problem if we have determinant of A non-zero. But in the general case that M is not equal to N, so what we need to do is that so this is the, probably, I mean, the notation, probably it has to be R if you look at the previous, I mean, slides, which means that we build a triangular matrix from the set of equation. So this is a triangular matrix. Then we make like a extended matrix here by just bringing, bringing the right-hand side vector here. Okay, but this right-hand side vector might have been changed because of doing this Gaussian elimination. And based on this, we would like to comment on the solvability of a system of equation. So if what we do is that we find the rank of matrix A, we also find the rank of A extended by B. And B is the right-hand side. We find the rank, these two rank. Do you know what rank is? Okay. So, rank of a matrix is the number of rows or columns. which are linearly independent. You remember that we, we worked on this linear independence in the last, I mean, oh, three previous sessions. You remember? So we look at the rows in this case and see how many of these rows are linearly independent. That becomes the rank of that matrix. Either it is A, the original matrix, or it is extended by B. <clears throat> so it's very simple. You find the rank of these two, A and A extended by B. So if the, these two ranks are not the same, that system is inconsistent, has no solution, and that's it. But if these two ranks are the same, which means that the system is consistent, then if these two ranks are the same and are equal to n number of unknowns, then the system has a unique solution. But if this rank is smaller than n, we, have, we may have infinitely many solutions, which means that we have arbitrary uh, values, at least for, for some of the unknowns. Yes? Huh? Huh? Ah, this A, this A is, uh, is this guy. This line? Yeah, this is exactly this guy. So this line is that, and this is B. So A, B is this guy. So if you would like to get rank of this, then you should look at the rows of this and see how many of them are linearly independent. That becomes rank of A extended by B. But if you would like to see the rank of A, you just look at this and see.